any time that a pastor gets to the pulpit early. I have met this morning uh, several who are uh, grandchildren or great-grandchildren of some of you. So I'm asking them to give me some stories before they leave this morning. Well, I'll have some preaching material for the next few weeks or months, okay? So if you're a grandchild here and you can share something about a grandparent, that would be great. Can you say it with me? It's all about the tree, and the tree is all about you. Don't miss what it's all about. Throughout the month, that's been our theme. And it came to pass that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, her child. Wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord it surprised them with an announcement. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass when the angels had gone away from them in the heavens, the shepherds said one to another, Let us go now and see this thing which has been made known to us, which the Lord has revealed to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph, and there the baby lying in a manger. And when they had seen all that had been told unto them, they said, why don't we go and tell some others about this good news? And they did. They made known abroad all that had been shared with them. And the people that heard wondered. And the people that heard wondered. If you are in any way familiar with Texas Baptist work, you know that the Buckner Children's Home and children's work throughout Texas has been around for lots of years. They have several children's homes, family homes throughout the state. A few years ago at Christmas time in, in the Beaumont Children's Home, they asked the children to make a list of some things they wanted for Christmas, putting one at the top of the list. If they could get only one gift, that gift, they made their list and the director of the children's home gave that list to a local church which participated in that gift giving time. They came to the time of the party when they gave out the gifts and they gave all the gifts but when they came to the, to the last one they thought there had been a mistake. There was a little eight year old boy and the only gift that was left was a little baby doll. But he said, that's exactly what I had on my list. I wanted a gift to be able to give to my three-year-old sister the next time that our family can visit. What seemed to be a mistake, a blatant miscommunication, was actually a great expression of love. What the world thought was a mistake, miscommunication, not what was needed or expected, was in fact the most beautiful and costly expression of love ever. God gave his son. Amen. 
Did you buy a Christmas tree this year? It's absolutely amazing what we invest in Christmas trees. We, and I'm lost this morning because Miss Brenda's not sitting down here where I can point at her. She's over here with some of our family and friends. And so if I get out of sync, but we had talked about getting a, a Christmas tree for some time. I mean, ours, ours was in bad shape. I mean, we, we were basically just putting twisted green wire in a tall, skinny pole because all the needles had deteriorated through the years. So, so we rationalized the expense of a new tree, saying to ourselves, well, it's going to last a long time, and, and it's already got lights on it. <laughs> Newsflash. A pre-lit tree actually means that at one point, when they plugged it in, it worked. But even after we got all the lights working, Miss Brenda decided we needed more lights on the tree. Now we've become a SRP most valued customer. <laughs> now, now some of you, you say, Dad, no artificial tree for me. I'm going to cut my own tree. It's cheaper, right? Mm, let's think about that. Permit, snow tires, winter clothes, toe out of the snow, emergency room visit for stitches. Priceless. But it was, sure was fun. We come to this fourth message of our series on this Sunday that, that is... Christmas, and we consider the most expensive tree ever. Not yours, not mine, not the Rockefeller Center tree, not the White House tree, but the one that stood on Calvary's Hill, the most expensive tree ever, decorated with God's love. Peter wrote the words that we've shared each week in chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself, Jesus Christ, bore our sins in his body on the cross, on the tree, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you are healed. There are all around us reminders that it's Christmas. We have some in here and some out there and some in the office. I keep getting reminded of Christmas with people bringing me plates of goodies. Someone asked me the other day what size jacket I wear. It has changed dramatically since I came here. And you guys have contributed to that. But we look around us and we see decorations and lights and tinsel candles, mistletoe. Tammy Davis was telling about her Christmas traveling experience and checking in at the airport. She saw a sprig of mistletoe hanging above the, the counter and she asked in a, in a festive voice, maybe she was a bit hopeful, what's a mistletoe for? The young man behind the counter pointed at the Brig of mistletoe and said, Oh, that? That's so you can kiss your luggage goodbye. <laughs> Aren't you glad that you're not traveling anywhere this weekend, <laughs> especially back east? I checked, and this is not in my notes, but I checked this morning. The temperature in Buffalo was about 10, but they had 37 inches of snow and expecting three more feet of snow. Aren't you glad that you're here? Christmas makes you wonder. It said that the people they told wondered. Have you ever wondered about Christmas? Some of you are wondering right now. I remember one mom asked her little boy what was the highest number he'd ever counted, and he said 537. She said, 537, why did you stop there? He said, because church was over. <laughs> As I said, some of you are 
wondering, counting right now. Yeah, this may not always be the most exciting place to be. It should be. Can I get an amen? I mean, it should be. But that's another sermon for another day. But that night, oh, that night, a night filled with excitement, a night pierced with angelic announcement, a night full of meaning with the miraculous birth, glorious birth of Jesus. A night that opened a, a new chapter of hope and, and history for the world. Oh, what an exciting night. But I, I'm sure there was some wondering going on that night. Mary and Joseph, well, they had been counting nine long months of waiting, and they come to that night. They had to have wondered, is it going to be this way, a, a stable, no place in the inn? Is this where the Savior is going to be born? They, they wondered, I'm sure. And, and the shepherds, well, they had been counting sheep and hours. But they had to wonder, and, and I suspicion they, they said to one another, Hey, are, are you seeing and hearing what I'm seeing and hearing? Angels? I suspicion they'd never seen an angel before. But they saw angels, a host of them. And why are they telling us good news about a baby? They wondered. And the people they told, Scripture says, all the people wondered. Did they think that the shepherds were, were on something? That they'd found some loco weed of some kind out there on the hillside? How could they make up such a story? And how can all of them be telling us the same thing? They wondered. Well, I'm wondering. Who stayed with the sheep when the shepherds left? The angels? I'm wondering, why would God do it that way? Well, wonder if you will, and, and I suppose that we all have. But once by faith, you accept the evidence that he did do all of these things. He did do all of this. It will be the most exciting day or night of your life, for that will be Christmas. The wonder of wonders is that he did it all for you. All for you. The manger, the cross, the empty tomb, all out of love. For God so loved, he gave. And you can know that for a fact. You do not have to just wonder. Someone has quipped, after Christmas is over, all the gifts have been opened, most people realize there are only two kinds of gifts. The ones that you wanted and the ones that you got. And over the next few days, some of you are going to be standing in line at Walmart where the greeters will not be angels and they will not be smiling and you're there because of what you got, what you received. It was not the, the perfect gift. God gave us the, the needed perfect gift. The world did not need a, a soldier. The world did not need a politician. The world did not need a reformer. The world needed a Savior. And that is exactly according to Matthew 1, what God gave us. For the angel said to Joseph, you will call him Jesus because he will save, he will be the Savior. He will save his people from their 
sins. One who would by his own death upon that tree that we've talked about all month pay the full price for our salvation. God gave Christmas. First of all, it was a, an undeserved gift. Romans 5 says that while we were yet sinners, God loved us so much that he gave his son for us. He commended his love toward us, for us, and gave us his son, Christ Jesus. God saw your worth. You may have given some gifts this year that you may even have felt that the person getting the gift did not deserve it. It was a, a gift of obligation because they gave me this last year. I need to give them this year. Or because they're part of the family. Or because he's our pastor. <laughs> Some people you did not deem worthy of getting gifts. But God found great worth in you. And he gave the greatest of all gifts. He saw your worth. And undeserving as we might have been, he gave. That gift was also unexpected. Mary and Joseph were expecting, yes. But the world was not expecting it to happen as it did. Where it did. In a lowly stable. In an out of the way place. To these two promised and prophesied the world expected a, a, a king the world expected someone to, to free them from their bondage to liberate them savior from their plight and what they expected was not what they got but the gift far exceeded their expectation I recall vividly and you'll wonder maybe why but I recall vividly a phone call on a Sunday morning, October the 10th, 2010. Brenda was in Texas with our kids in the anticipation of the C-section delivery of our fourth granddaughter. Nine months of waiting and ultrasounds and sonograms and then a healthy 10 pound, six ounce baby boy. Davis, not Braylon. Our son was so dumbfounded when he called me that morning, all he could say was, Dad, he's a boy. <laughs> Duh. I remember telling our staff at that time the surprise that we had. He wasn't what we were expecting. The pink room was blue overnight, and all the girly things were taken back. And though he was not what we were expected, he was a wonder. Jesus wasn't what the world expected, but he was a wonder, the wonder of wonders. Do you ever wonder? I do. Did, did Mary and Joseph ever use a babysitter? <laughs> and what did, the, what did the babysitter think? Wow. Watching the perfect son of God? I, I read about a couple that had been out for the evening and they were late returning home. Later than they had expected and they kept apologizing to their babysitter about it. And she said, blunt teenager that she was, she said, no need to apologize. If I had kids like yours, I wouldn't want to be home either. <laughs> Jesus, well, he was, he was the perfect gift, the, the wonder of wonders. As we have said, Christmas trees are expensive, but none compares to the tree that we've talked about listen to the words of peter that he used to describe the cost of that tree first peter chapter one 
knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished, sinless, spotless, the blood of Jesus Christ. Hmm. You ever unwrapped a gift and you didn't know what to say? I'm not talking about what you almost said. What is it? Oh, no, not another one of these. What were they thinking? Peter exclaimed of God's gift, unmatched, unblemished, unspeakable. That is indescribable. No words can adequately describe the cost of this gift, his only begotten son. May I wonder out loud for a moment? Do you think that Mary counted fingers and toes? Do you think Joseph ever changed a diaper? Do you think they ever asked of each other, who do you think he looks like? Now, there's a great theological question. Forgive my simplistic thinking, if you might, but I think he looked like love. Love. God is love. And this costly gift would pay the ultimate price upon the tree. And when we open that gift, we must say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the price you paid for my sin, the spilt blood of Calvary's tree that washes white as snow. Now, this is probably a man thing. No, it's not probably. It is a man thing. Some of us men have made Christmas tree promises through the years. I'll never do this again. I'll never put up this tree again. I'll never fight these lights again. And I have this in my notes, but I did not know you were going to be here this morning, Kelly. But my friend Kelly over here, he uh, built a place kind of on his back patio, and he put his Christmas tree on rollers, <laughs> covered it with a, a plastic garb, and rolled it away every year. I don't know if you still do that or not, Kelly, but that works for me. This tree that we've talked about, the most expensive tree, is filled with promise. God promise. God promises. God fulfilled his promise. A savior. Emmanuel, God with us. His plan to usher in salvation through the womb of a young virgin girl. Incarnation. God became man and, and dwelt among us. Incomprehensible. The wonder of all wonders. That he who created woman would be born of one. That he, the, the ancient of days, would become our timely at just the right moment Savior. That he who created all the wonders and the marvels of the universe, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, he chose to be born in poverty rather than wealth. Not in a palace, but a stable. Not with princes as attendants, but with shepherds who stood by. That he who dressed the heavens in glorious garb was found wrapped in strips of cloth, swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. 
Mary's little lamb child, born to be your Savior and your Lord. The promise that those who accept, those who open, those who unwrap this gift will know his love, the unconditional love that saw him send his son, that saw his son, Jesus, give his life upon the cross. The promise, it, the gift, is for you. Hear again the words that Jesus spoke to a man named Nicodemus, to a little boy in rural West Tennessee named Robert Louis, to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, whosoever should believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Merry Christmas. The message is so simple, yet so real. He gave you the greatest gift ever. Most of us are at least somewhat familiar with the familiar Charles Dickens work that is a seasonal favorite of Christmas Carol. After its publication, after Scrooge became famous, and Dickens' writings were of great public interest, he, he quietly began a new work for his children. And from 1843 until 1846, he worked on this, what he called his children's New Testament. It was strictly written for his family. He wanted his children to learn about the life and teachings of Christ in plain and simple language. The work would become known as the life of our Lord and his desire to keep it private, confidential, was honored. He contained the basics of the gospel moving from Christ's birth to the resurrection, but it was kept confidential until his son Henry finally passed away, and Henry's wife allowed it to be published in 1934. But I want you to listen to the, to the personal introduction that Dickens penned as, as the opening remarks for his work, entitled The Life of Our Lord. He said this, My dear children, I'm very anxious that you should know something about the history of Jesus Christ, for everybody ought to know about him. Oh, my friend, I do not want that you should know about Jesus Christ, about Christmas. I would want that you know Jesus Christ and know Christmas. Father, It's something that I do wonder about, how you could love the way you do, the way you did in giving your son, and the way he did in giving his life. But Father, while I may not be able to explain it, I can experience it and have experienced it. Thank you for that love. And Father, I know your desire is that everyone in this room Know that same Jesus. Know that same love. Know Christmas. And I pray in these closing moments this morning that our hearts would be tender to your Holy Spirit speaking to us, that we might be willing to be obedient. But, Father, we might be willing, if there's one in this room, might be willing to accept what you have done for us, not to wonder anymore, but to know for fact. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Christmas. It's in the precious name of our Savior we pray.
I'm going to ask you in just a moment to stand, and Brother George is going to lead us.